I have been working in the technology industry for just over 10 years now. Um, my background was in history and philosophy, so I had a kind of a interesting pathway to uh, getting into technology. And really, um, you know, I, I guess 11, 12 years ago when I was in college, I took my first course on environmental ethics. Um, I took other courses on urban poverty and race and uh, power, political power. And I, I kind of left my undergraduate um, studying history and philosophy with a sense of like how far humanity has come, um, but also how far we still need to go to make a world that works for everybody. And so I kind of left my undergraduate with a, a deep sense of like, I need to be a part of the change. And that took me a bunch of different paths. Um, I did pre-med for a while. I became an emergency medical technician. Um, and eventually I, I realized that uh, I was really interested in the kind of science part. And science and technology seemed to be this core uh, part of the solution, right? We were talking about all these policies. And I had done a brief stint in political science. And I kind of walked away from that master's uh, because it felt like I was going to you know, spend two years writing a thesis and then no one was going to read it. And even my professors are saying, like, these are all the changes we need to make in the world, and this is why they'll never get passed uh, because of corruption or political division. And so it seemed like I was like, well, if solutions are technology or science related. Maybe I need to go learn science and technology. And so that took me down a path, eventually led me to software. And I saw software as this kind of core uh, technology that's be permeating through everything else. And that really allowed me to uh, seek out companies that I was really focused on making an impact. So whether it was educational technology or agriculture. Um, and that's really what I've been doing for the last 10 years, really focused on trying to do the most good I could do with my, my career. Um, and that's something I kind of cone down to really every day. I ask myself, am I doing the most good I can do with my time? And, uh, and so about two and a half years ago, um, I was kind of doing the same thing when COVID hit, uh, as well as the social unrest uh, uh, after uh, the murder of George Floyd and Rihanna Taylor. And I, I just wanted to do more. And so, I, and I, I didn't know how, so I started kind of thinking about it. And I really put out just a call on social media saying like, I want to help. I will give loans to black owned businesses. I'll offer free mentorship if you want to get in coding. And um, that's kind of where I met my co-founder, uh, a sustainable progress and equality collective. But we can kind of dig more into that. So that kind of speeds us up to the beginning of, of the collective and how we kick things off. Um, but that's a little bit of background about myself. Uh, perfect. And before we dig in up deeper, I thought that uh, we can maybe define the key vocabulary because um, I believe that meanings of many concepts are still might be unclear for many people. So can you please define what environmental sustainability and social justice means in relation to your project? Environmental sustainability is a really complex you know, concept and uh, it intersects with uh, social justice. Um, and when we're talking about social justice, we're really talking about um, access to opportunity, um, being able to be included in the conversation, um, being able to have access to the same resources, and um, and really being treated uh, equally. And so both of these uh, concepts are deeply interrelated, and you kind of come to the point of intersectional environmentalism, where you see the, the interconnections of both how we interact with the environment and to interact with the, uh, each other. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of uh, overlap in the work that we're doing at SPEC to try to both help the environment and help other people. Uh, traveling back to the start of the pandemic, uh, what were the observations that you've noticed in society and uh, what eventually spurred the idea of SPEC to come to life? Yeah, so I think that the, the big kind of catalyst was when I met my co-founder, Dr. Rogers, um, who at the time was a professor at a State University of New York. And I, when I had po posted my call to social media, um, Dr. Rogers had reached out and um, had a project where um, she had a couple students, mainly women of color, that were doing research and building communities during times of social unrest. And I was like, this is so relevant to what's happening right now, like what's more important than building community. And um, after we started talking a little bit more and, and kind of understanding the work that they were doing, um, she explained that they were essentially going to lose their summer internships 
And so I, I offered to just pay for at least one intern's um, uh, summer internship and then try to help find uh, more uh, funding for more of these interns. And that kind of snowballed. But at that point where I realized the thing that I was missing had come full circle because I had come back from this humanities background. You know, I was trying to understand humans and then I was like, oh, well, we have all these scientific problems we need to solve. And then I came full circle to realize that we still need to get everybody on board. So even if we have the solutions, which I think we do, I think we have the technological solutions of science to be able to provide everybody with a high quality of life, with health care and food and uh, a potential opportunity for you know productive work. Those things all exist, but they don't seem to be getting down to the individual people. And the work that Dr. Rogers was doing is really this idea of participatory action research. So instead of this top-down that this is how we're going to fix things. Instead, you're engaging with the communities, the people that you're actually espousing to, to want to help and empower them through education, learning, in our case, just paying people to learn in some cases, uh, to be able to, to have agency over their own lives and hopefully not just escape maybe poverty or, or, or have better opportunity, but really show people that you know they can make an impact with their career. So we help somebody find financial sustain- sustainability or sustainable career for themselves. They'll be able to take that and in turn pay it back or help someone move forward. And so that was definitely one of the observations and, and big learnings for me because I had been thinking about this since college of like how do we <laughs> how do we solve these big complex world problems? And I had been thinking a very systems high level technical side. And Dr. Rogers kind of introduced me to a lot of these ideas of these participatory methods and even action research itself as a as a as a concept of of both teaching and giving people agency to ask a question of like there's something happening in the world let's take some action try to fix it use research to inform our decisions and then critically reflect on those changes um and so that's something that we're we're kind of really digging into is is working with the communities that we we want to help uh, SPEC steering committee works on entirely volunteering basis. Uh, how would you say, based on your experience, where is this equilibrium between being engaged in meaningful social initiatives and still being a functional, financially functional individual? Well, we're not all volunteer, and actually I think that's a, a good uh, distinction. Um, the co-founders are volunteers, so I don't make any money from SPEC. Um, if any, I've donated, actually, um, money to spec. Uh, But we do pay our contributors, and actually that's a core concept for us, especially for folks who are trying to make a career change um, or trying to get into technology, especially for folks that um, are from underrepresented communities in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. What we realize is that there's already a burden that is put on people to either pay for education, or especially if they're doing career changes, they might already have student loans. We believe that people should get paid for their time, even if they're learning. And so um, actually, I think a core part of our, our process is that we, we provide paid internships for folks who are learning. And what we try to do is we try to create real-world opportunities for them, paying them. You know, we can't pay a huge amount because we're still figuring out how to you know, make money from this process. But you know, we've had myself, uh, Dr. Rogers, other people who have donated money, and really we're taking those funds and creating paid work opportunities we call service learning where they are both learning on the job and we're aligning that with working on other community initiatives, um, including some collectives within the the open collective ecosystem right now. And so um, we really think that's kind of an embodiment of this principle of mutual reciprocity, which is really like kind of a balance of mutual respect and accountability. Uh, We want to be able to respect their contributors, empower them to make a change and make sure that they are also being accountable to get the work done and we believe that that is that's something that people should get paid for. If we want to build equity, we can't add more barriers, right? Like instead of making them pay us, like a coding boot camp or a school, we want to pay them to move forward in their careers. And hopefully, you know, if we can help them achieve that goal, at some point they'll be able to, to pay it forward for somebody else. Uh, I really want to go deeper into philosophy of uh, the whole idea, but uh, since you've mentioned uh, Open Collective and collaboration with other collectives, maybe you can tell us a bit more about how did you meet and discover Open Collective, what was your experience uh, dealing with it, and uh, about your collaboration with other collectives involved in this ecosystem? Yeah, Open Collective is just 
I, I mean, I think it's one of the most important technologies and platforms out there. I, re- I really do. Um, when, when Dr. Rogers and I started, we first met, uh, you know, I immediately was like, I wanted to give students money to be able to do this. And Dr. Rogers was like, you know, I, I think I have other people who might be interested in donating, contributing. I want to be able to contribute. Um, but we needed some entity to be able to collect funds for myself and other people in our community. And as a software developer, I remembered that Open Collective is used for open source projects, and I vaguely remembered it being used for meetups. So I went to the uh, website, I read more about it, learned that I could get fiscal sponsorship from a nonprofit. Uh, so we wouldn't have to go through the whole process of applying to become a nonprofit ourselves. And so I think I met Dr. Rogers like on a Thursday, and by like the next week, I had a good idea that we we're going to apply, and I applied. And I think about a week or a week and a half from meeting Dr. Rogers and kind of having the initial idea, you know, we created the name Sustainable Progress and Equality Collective. We applied. We got approval from the Open Collective Foundation. That's our fiscal sponsor. And they're a 501c3, which is the the, the, uh, nonprofit uh, code in the U.S. And so we were kind of up and running roughly within a week of, of the co-founders meeting and I put some money into Open Collective and a week later we were able to pay people and this is all transparent. This is the other piece that is really part of the philosophy and ethos of spec and why Open Collective is so aligned with us um, or we're aligned with Open Collective is that we believe that you know one of the problems I think a lot of people have with charities and nonprofits is they the people are still not sure if the money's actually getting to the to the source of the problem right there's a lot of graft there's a lot of uh, organizations where the money's not getting to the to the heart of the issue where open collective kind of flips that on its head and says like let's make this completely open be really transparent and so uh, yeah within a week and a half we really got our organization up and running we were able to tax deductible donations and start paying contributors so that that really streamlines the process especially in the US you have to pay fees you have to go through a lot of you have to create a board a business plan and really we just wanted to start paying people to do research and learning we didn't want to have to go through that whole kind of bureaucratic structure and so open collective really accelerated our ability to start working and doing um, doing the things that we were, were hoping to make the world better um, without having to go through that that long um, laborious process. Um, and now that we're working in the ecosystem, there's other collectives that are both under the Open Collective Foundation's fiscal sponsorship, but also other uh, fiscal sponsors that we're starting to work with and collaborate. Um, having our contributors work on other you know nonprofit initiatives. Uh, can you name any of the collectives or any particular initiatives that you've been involved with other people you've met there? Sure. So right now we're working with Data Umbrella. That's a um, kind of community uh, focus on um, building diversity and equity and inclusion in the data science field. And we're also working with uh, Build Justly, which is a uh, organization that's focused on really understanding um, uh, biases and, and really making software that is inclusive and uh, doing this through qualitative and quantitative research, actually looking at how software companies essentially build bias into the software. So both of them are um, diversity focused, which is very aligned with their, with their own focus on diversity, equity, inclusion. So uh, we were one of the first collectives to kind of start building relationships and actually drafting documents to have a, you know, an agreement with other collectives. Um, and then we're able to, you know, they're able to pay us for our services directly through the platform as a collective to collective transfer, um, which I think is free. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's free for all collectives, but I know between the Open Collective Foundation, it's uh, there's no additional charges when we're moving money between collectives. So that's a really great feature. Uh, can you also expand more on what underrepresented and non-traditional backgrounds have you worked with already and uh, seeing how many communities uh, out there is in need right now, how do you prioritize and how do you define vectors for future cooperation? Sure. So, uh, I mean, typically, you know, right now we're working a lot in the kind of technology industry. So when you look at underrepresented uh, communities, uh, it's it's still the especially in the United States, the technology sector is still heavily dominated by white and Asian cisgender men. Overwhelmingly, um, we have seen some tick 
ticks up in diversity, but for the most part, the, there's still major gaps when it comes to gender gaps and racial gaps um, for uh, um, brown and, and black people. So, um, as well as LGBTQ plus community, Not, all of those communities, uh, underrepresented groups, they don't have the same level of representation in technology. And so we see that as a really um, important area to try to affect. The other important piece there too is that these same many of these same communities are also the ones that are in underserved communities um, and so they haven't had the, the same access that you might have uh, to uh, uh, career in, and uh, financial opportunity and we see being able to help somebody get into an industry like software especially in the United States that has really great um, career opportunity and growth as a way that if you if you can bring somebody to get a job even myself you know I, I uh, when I got my first software uh, job, I was making more money than I had ever, had ever made and really making more money than my dad had made his entire career. That's a generational jump in our in, in financial stability. And if you can help somebody who's who's living paycheck to paycheck or, or kind of a lower income and be able to jump into that, not only have you transformed their lives, but you could transform an entire community because they have the resources now to help other people. And so um, that's definitely been a focus of working with uh, the underrepresented folks in the STEM field and trying to fill those gaps. Uh, speaking of the geography of project, do you work only with the US citizens or is it worldwide? Are there any examples of people's life being changed into some uh, third world countries maybe? Um, we haven't really delved too much into international development. That's partially because the Open Collective Foundation is a U.S.-based nonprofit, and so we can hire contributors uh, that are international, but right now we can't, or at least we, we haven't focused on international development projects um, uh, directly, uh, but we definitely ha are working on other projects that um, can, can potentially have a, a broader impact. We also work on open source, so the, because we're, we work on open source, like that enables us to share information and work with uh, folks from around the world. Um, we do see kind of a, a bigger picture growth for spec, but you know, like you were talking about, how do you strategically figure out where you go next? I think at least in my mind, we're, we're taking a very organic, evolutionary, iterative approach. Uh, you know, each partnership we're trying to understand and learn. Um, you know, we're working with a very diverse group of folks, you know, not just racially or gender uh, diversity, but also neurodiversity, um, you know, different backgrounds, people working on different time zones across the country. And so there are definitely challenges that we're learning, you know, and working with the community. Um, and I think because of that, we've also... We're, you know, we're not like a hyper growth startup, so we're not trying to get to the next seed round and make more money to get to the next place. Uh, you know, we want to kind of grow organically um, in a way that's going to be healthy for our contributors and our community. Uh, one of the SPEC's mission is to shape the next generation of leaders. Uh, how uh, has the concept of leadership changed over the last, let's say, decade? And what does being a leader mean in the modern world? Yeah, I think that leadership, I think it really comes down to, honestly, a, a certain level of mindfulness and deep listening and compassion. I think those are the things that are, at least in my mind, missing from leadership. And when we're talking about, you know, especially in the United States, I think we've had kind of almost fetishized the, the idea of becoming a self-made millionaire or billionaire and that leadership and, and executive management is just kind of like, how can you maximize on profits and growth? And really what Open Collective and the kind of concept of the solidarity economy is flipping that on its head as well. It's, it's saying it's not, it's not profit and growth, it's people and planet. And so I think the leaders that we need need to be indexing on that of thinking about people and planet um, first. And, and, and I think it comes down to a compassion and uh, uh, trying to really understand the, the way that people are struggling and how, how we can help. Um, what do you do to exercise this uh, human part of yourself? Yeah, I think it comes first and foremost with just like culture and making sure that within the organization that we're always coming back to what we consider our core principles, our core values of, of mutual reciprocity, like I had mentioned, but also our commitment to openness, transparency, to diversity, equity, inclusion, to sustainability. So when we talk about projects, 
we we will be asking, and I will encourage the contributors to ask, like, how could this help somebody? I also encourage, especially folks who first come in, um, I, I try to, to articulate to them that this isn't just a job where you get hired as an employee and I tell you what to do. If you have an idea about your community, like I was just talking to a potential contributor who wants to apply, and they were saying that the homelessness in their community really is, is concerning to them and they want to be able to help and they have had some ideas but they didn't really know to get start that's the kind of project we'll be like run with that like go work with this other person and start thinking about a way to work on your community come back when you have an idea and we'll start working on that and so really encouraging people to see issues in their own communities and encourage them to have the agency and say hey you're not alone at this we actually have a team of people who also care leverage our different resources and our, our different knowledges uh, to to be able to make an impact in the world, and we've already had some folks who have kind of moved on and are actively either you know in the final stages of starting their own nonprofit or starting to do community work or at least mentoring other people and moving forward. And so it really is that um, getting to a point to the person can take care of themselves. They have enough stability in their career to then be able to think about, oh, I could make a difference in a community. Um, and so really working and encouraging people to have a, a creative lens for how they can make the world better and feel like they actually can. It's not just them. Uh, one more thing that I really wanted to touch upon is the fact that SPEC takes inspiration from the work of the renowned 20th century inventor and visionary Richard Buckminster Fuller. Uh, can you provide us with a short insight to Fuller's work and his philosophy and what inspires you personally in his approach to the worldview? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Buckminster Fuller is a huge inspiration for me, um, and it's definitely some uh, someone that I bring up when we're talking about things. Uh, Buckminster Fuller is uh, well known for creating the geodesic dome that you've probably seen in a bunch of different places. Uh, interestingly, Buckminster Fuller was really interested in the geodesic dome because he was thinking about how can you maximize space with minimized materials. He was really obsessed with kind of optimizing for... Um, you know, he, he, he really hated the idea of that we're using all of our technological power to create war games and weapons. And he was like, instead of us having war games and weapons, we should have peace games and living rate was the word. He, Buckminster Fuller loves creating new words, and his word was living rate. And his idea was, he, he had an idea for what he called the world game. The reason he called it a, a game, because he wanted it to be accessible to people. But the idea was, that this is like the 1960s, before computing really was there is he imagined that you could have all these kind of experts in the room and we would collect all the information about the resources in the world and we would figure out a way to equitably you know distribute uh, these technologies and, and, and use you know modern technology to really deliver a high quality of life for everybody um, and at the time he was very ahead of his time when it came to the technology because it didn't really exist to be able to achieve this uh, but this goal of being able to try to accelerate uh, making the world work for 100% of people while still balancing uh, environmental concerns and social um, uh, concerns uh, is definitely something that we derive uh, uh, inspiration from. And, uh, you know, we see this kind of as an extension. We're using Open Collective to help people. We're trying to develop open source hardware uh, in spaces like agriculture and, and medicine to be able to lower the barriers of access to things like food and medicine. And so uh, it's definitely within the ethos of SPEC to see how can we leverage technology to, to help people and impact the world. Um, and uh, definitely uh, there's, the Buckminster Fuller's uh, work is, is pretty prolific, and there's a lot of really... Uh, good pieces of information from his work that we, we try to leverage. Uh, for those interested in going deeper with all these topics apart from Buckminster Fuller's work, uh, who would you recommend to explore any books, personalities, any philosophies out there? Um, I would definitely check out Pia Mancini at Open Collective. Uh, she's one of the most inspiring people I know and and uh, has created a platform that has enabled uh, is so much of the work that we've done and, and really tons of mutual aid organizations out there as well. Um, and so, it, yeah, I think I, I just highly recommend people to check out Open Collective, see the work that's happening there. The community is open. They have a public Slack channel. Um, I, and they have a blog. I, I would just focus people there because I, I think that's where I derive a lot of my optimism and hope right now is that it's not just spec, 
it's this whole group of other collectives that are working together to do mutual aid and, ho- and, and help other people. And I think that's ultimately where we need to be. We, it can't just be individual organizations trying to like vie for funding and fight each other. We need to really build solidarity among these organizations. So uh, I would definitely check out what they're doing at Open Collective and, and their blog. And I think you'll find some really uh, rich information there.